I'm going to do my best this morning, Kim. I can't guarantee anything. I, I talk fast, apparently. So when it comes to this service, I, I try to slow my roll down a little bit, but normally uh, Kim's sweating at the end. So I'm sorry in advance for that. <laughs> so welcome. My name is Chris. Uh, I get to serve as a youth pastor here at ACC. And, uh, and I would say if you have a student, uh, just sign them up for Fajara now. We have a discount of $40 off the regular ticket price. So it ends today. So make sure they sign up. It'll be super fun. Uh, and we do go to the beach because I believe that winter should end early this year, uh, regardless of what Phil says. So, uh, I've had a, a tough week this week. Um, I've been asked to, to speak on hope um, this week. And uh, on Tuesday, I got a call from my son's school. He had fallen and hurt his wrist. So we took him to the doctor. Luckily, nothing major happened. And he'll just be sore for a couple of days. And boy, did he milk that for all it was worth. And then uh, my daughter on Thursday morning around 3 a.m. woke up and decided that it was the best time to start throwing up and hasn't stopped. Uh, So that's fun. Uh, And now my wife texted me this morning and said that she's equally not feeling well, which is great uh, because we're supposed to leave for Atlanta on Tuesday. So so it's it's great, right? This is the week for hope. (laughs) And we all have weeks like that where it seems as though everything is kind of going against us. And it's hard for us to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And in those weeks, we have to be very mindful to keep our eyes focused on the right thing, right? But it's tough. When you're in the trenches of difficulties, often all you can see is the shrapnel and the damage that's being done to you. It's hard to see the hope. So I get the opportunity this morning to talk a little bit about why we have hope. Uh, In 2003, uh, going into my senior year of high school, I had the opportunity to go to a wrestling camp. I wrestled from the time I was a a small child all the way up through high school and had the opportunity to wrestle in college, but I turned it down uh, when I uh, was called into ministry and I instead went and played baseball. Now, during my senior year, uh, before my senior year that summer, uh, my parents paid for me to go to this really elite camp up in Minnesota. They have them in uh, different increments, uh, five days, 10 days, 14 days. Uh, But the one I went to was 28 days long. So I loaded up on a plane, me and six other guys on our team, and flew to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and stayed for a month. Now, the month looked like this. Uh, We would wake up in the morning at 6 a.m. We would have four to six practices per day. We would break for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, where you would eat enough to get through the day, but not so much that you would get sick at practice. Uh, You would do this for 28 straight days. It was the, in the middle of summer, it was the closest thing to boot camp I think I've ever experienced. Now, my parents, loving parents that they are, uh, told me that if I was to quit, that I would have to walk home. (laughs) I know they're watching online, so you're welcome. But here's the deal. That first week of camp, there were kids quitting, crying, going home, getting hurt. I mean, at the end of at the end of week one, we were probably at half of the number of people. Now, now what were we going for? Like what was the purpose? Well, of course, to be a better wrestler. But really, the goal was to get this shirt. (laughs) A shirt that simply says, I did it. Oh, yeah. Well, you think I'm joking. No, no, no. This is it. 28 days. And on the side, if you can see, it just says 28 days. Now, you might think that's a pretty menial gift. But if you were to wear this shirt and go into a wrestling room, there would be a a high level of respect for being able to accomplish uh, this task because of how difficult it was. So what kept me going in the midst of those difficult days? Two things. Uh, one, the people that I went with, right? The, the friends that I had that encouraged me and, and lifted me up in those difficult days. And two, was a hope that I knew that it was going to end. <laughs> it, it had to end. They couldn't keep us. So this morning we're going to talk about where do we find our hope. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to flip open to Romans chapter 8. 
We've been doing this series called The Greatest Chapter. We're looking at Romans chapter 8, which most scholars agree is one of the greatest chapters, if not the, in all of the Bible, with its breadth and its depth of theology and, and, and wisdom. And so we're going to continue to explore this in part two uh, of this series. To give you a little bit of context on Romans 8, uh, Paul is writing this book, or this, uh, what we call a book, but it's really a letter, to this church in Rome, and, and Paul has a deep love for the church in Rome. He, he loves them dearly. He didn't start the church in Rome. He's never been to the church in Rome, but he has this deep love rooted for the church in Rome, and rightfully so, right? Rome is the center of the world at that time. Paul's desire is to be in Rome, but when he's writing this letter, he's on a mission trip, his third mission trip, and he's collected money, and he's got to take it back to Jerusalem, and when he gets back to Jerusalem, he delivers the money, and then he's arrested. Now, if you want to read a really sweet story of how Paul gets to Rome, I'd recommend you later this afternoon, don't do it while I'm teaching, right later this afternoon, flip back a couple pages in your Bible to Acts 21, and that's where Paul starts his journey to Rome, and it takes him seven chapters to get there in a couple years, but it's incredible to see how God got him there. So Paul is writing this letter to the, to the church at Rome, and it gives us a little bit of an insight into Paul's life, his teachings, the foundational truths that he brings, and it allows us to kind of get a little insight into where he finds his hope. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 17, where Matt ended last week, kind of sets the stage for us coming into this week. Check this out, verse 17. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all of creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Paul kind of tees up here this first part, talking about the greatest glory that, that we will ever see. That God has yet to reveal the greatest glory to come. But he also tees up something really significant for us to understand. In order for you and me to see God's greatest glory, we must suffer. Now, I know this isn't like a super popular topic in America because we don't like to suffer. But suffering comes in all ways and shapes, right? And for us, Paul doesn't say you might, you could. There might be something bad that happens. He says you must suffer as Christ suffered. Which means the way, the way I tell it to students, that might mean you're rejected at school because Christ was rejected by his peers. It might mean you suffer a, a legitimate heartache or, or hardship. Suffering looks different. But Paul says something really neat. In this, but I want you. To, I want you to see. Paul's not speaking, kind of flippantly here. He's not just saying you kind of got to suffer and get through it. Look at look at what Paul does. Look at First Corinthians. It'll be on the screen. Look at what he says. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me thirty nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I face danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I face danger in the cities and in the deserts and on the seas. And I face danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. 
I have worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights I have been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm, and yet we're afraid of our friends not liking us. Paul says, I know suffering's not fun. I've endured more than you would have ever imagined. But look at verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Paul says all the difficulties that you're experiencing right now, (laughs) friends, they're nothing compared to what Jesus is bringing back. If our difficulties absorb our attention, they, they take our focus, then what happens is we blot out our focus for the eternal significance that we have. If we only focus on the things that are happening now, then we fail to remember the fact that God's bringing back something greater later. But equally important, how do we find hope now? Right, Chris, that's great. I have hope for heaven. Awesome. But I'm struggling now. I want to show you something else before I answer that question. Look at, look at what creation does. Paul does something interesting here. He takes creation and he makes it a person. He gives it feelings and emotions, right? Look at what he says in verse, uh, in verse 19. Creation is waiting eagerly. Verse 20, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Uh, but with eager hope, verse 21, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children. Verse 22, the creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. See, Paul's painting this picture of creation kind of on its tiptoes looking for, the, for God's future redemption. That creation is kind of like looking up over, like waiting to see what's coming next. I, I think of it like this. We went to the National Aquarium a couple weeks ago, uh, our whole family, and Aiden doesn't understand personal space. Y'all, y'all know what I mean by when kids don't understand personal space? Like it's really awkward when you're a parent and your kid doesn't get it. Because then there's like, hey, hey, right? Y'all know, maybe adults, there was a, don't get it, you don't understand personal space, but it's fine. So Aiden is at the National Aquarium. He's shoving through these lines to get to the front because he wants to see in the glass. He wants to see that snake or he wants to see that fish or that shark or something. So he's, he's just shoving his way out and trying to get up to the front. This is the picture that Paul is painting. That creation is, is eagerly waiting for God to come and redeem what's been broken. And so we, too, wait with eager expectation for God to come and to redeem what's been broken. But not only is the greatest glory yet to come, but we see something else. We see God has sent us the greatest help. Now, last week, Matt talked about the fact that this chapter alone references the Spirit of the Holy Spirit over 20 times, that God is trying to get something across to us. Take a look at verse 26 and 27. He says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Look at what the Spirit's doing for us. Check out these three things. The the Spirit is helping us in our weakness. He's praying for us, and He's pleading on our behalf before God. This is the greatest passage of Scripture when it comes to encouragement with prayer. If you're struggling in your prayer life this morning, you're like, I don't see the point. I don't know how to do it. Paul says, right, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Our weakness is not understanding prayer, not understanding how to do it or what to do or what to say or, or what's the right way to do it. Like, and so Paul says, look, the beautiful thing is that the groaning of creation in verse 22 The groaning of believers in verse 23 becomes the groaning of the Spirit in verse 26. That the Spirit is taking that anxiety inside of you that says, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to do this. And he is, in turn, translating that and taking it before God. 
And so when our lack of faith undermines certainty in prayer, that is when the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. When we come to the table and go, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel like this prayer thing's working. I've prayed for a year and it hasn't worked yet. In that moment where our certainty that prayer works is setting in and we begin to doubt, that is when the Spirit works on our behalf. He intercedes for us. And so we see not only do we have God's greatest glory yet to be revealed, not only do we see the greatest help in the Spirit, but we see something really interesting here at the end. I want to take a little bit of extra time to really zone in here. It says that God's greatest good is yet to come, right? Look at verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance. He chose them to become like his son so that his son will be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his Glory. This is kind of bookending the whole thing, right? At the beginning, we see God's glory is coming. How? Through me and you. Now, I want to speak for just a minute, and I might offend some people, and I'm okay with that, about something that I, a trend that I've seen happen in our churches, and especially with the rise of social media. We've, uh, we've adopted these, this new branch of Christianity that I, um, I would like to coin as the coffee cup Christians, you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? Uh, they're the Christians that always have that coffee cup phrase to say back to you when something bad happens. The reason why I say that is this is one of those passages. You know, you know what I mean? Like, having a bad day? It's all right. God works together all things for the good of those who love him. Oh, you stubbed your toe? Don't worry. God works together all good things for those who love him. Right? Oh, you lost your keys? Don't worry. God works together all things for the good of those who love him. Oh, you're nauseous? Don't worry. Your vomiting is is what God is working together for the good of those who love them. You guys see how, you see how this is wrong, right? The problem is that we've taken a verse and we've ripped it away from its original context, and then we just apply it flippantly to whatever situation is happening. And so it's like, ah, see my coffee cup? You tracking with me? If it can fit in a coffee cup, I can recite it. The problem is that in that, you're missing the point of what the verse is intended to mean. Verse 28, where he says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God. When, when Paul says that, he answers what the good is in the next passage. Look at verse 29. For God knew his people in advance and chose them to become like his son. God's greatest good is that you and me would become like him. So when, when Paul says God works together all things for the good of those who love him, he's saying my end goal is that you would become more like me. Not that you would apply this to your stub toe. And so what he's, what he's getting after is the good that we become more like him. See, when we see this, it shifts our perspective when bad things happen. See, when bad things happen, now we're not going, it's all right, a good things are coming. Right? Because here's what happens. Somebody's in the storm of life, and you're like, it's all right. You're about to get out of the storm and see the sunshine. Maybe not. Maybe they're about to go from one storm to another storm. And now your Bible verse is, well, you've wasted it. What are you going to say next time? You see, God's purpose is not for us to go, good thing, bad thing. Like, God's not a car, it's not karma, right? That's a different religion. Please don't apply karma to Christianity. God is not a God who goes, all right, one bad for Chris and, oh, one good. Oh, too bad for Chris? Oh, good news. Too good for Chris. God's purpose is for us to become like his son. So my thought for you is this. Let's shift our perspective on how we think about this. And rather, when the, when the bad thing happens next time, rather than going, God works together all things for the good of those who love him, maybe pose this question. Hey, how do you feel like this is pointing you back to Christ in your relationship with him? You see, the purpose behind the bad things that happen to us in our lives is to remind us that God is in charge. It's to point us back to him. 
maybe you, you've drifted off and that bad thing happens and you, you immediately where? Where do you go? You go back to God. We have to remember the same God who is our hope in the good times is the same God who's our hope in the bad times. But what tends to happen is when the bad things come, we go, God hates us. God's against us. God's not for us. If you're breathing, God is still for you. He has something for you. He could just as easily take you off this earth. And we also have to remember that God's purpose for us is our relationship, right? Now, I don't know if y'all know how relationships work. I'm assuming you do. I see some kids in the room. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Y'all took, y'all took that the wrong way. No, no. <laughs> Got to lighten the mood up a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Now, I don't know if you know how relationships work, but they're this ongoing back and forth, Right? Now, in all of our lives, we probably had people who have come and gone out of our lives, and relationships begin, and relationships end, and we had this, this wave that happens. But with God, it's intended to be this ongoing relationship from beginning to end. This is God's purpose here, that we would begin a relationship and start. I think about my dating relationships in, um, in college. Now, I told the students a couple weeks ago, uh, my dating relationships in college kind of look like this. Um, I believe that God's greatest good for my life was a brunette with blue eyes. And so if you were to look at all the girls I dated in college, I only dated brunette girls with blue eyes. It's 100% true. I can show you all their Facebook pictures. <laughs> now, I did not marry a brunette with blue eyes. If you know my wife or have seen her, I married a redhead with green eyes. Totally opposite of what I thought was my greatest good. Now, the reason why that's important it's because for me, I thought my greatest good is found in finding the right person. And if you're single this morning, or you're dating this morning, or if you're married and struggling this morning, I need you to hear this next line. God never intended for you to find the right person. God intended for you to become the right person. That's a difference right there. And that shifts your perspective in dating. No longer are you looking for what can this girl or guy get me, but how can I point this girl or guy to Jesus? The purpose of, of marriage and of dating was not to make you happy. And this is where marriages go awry, right? Well, don't make me happy anymore. Great. Not his intention. That's not the purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage is to make you holy, to point each other to Jesus. And so we see this beautiful picture here that when we stop looking for the right person and start being the right person, that God begins to bring the right people into our lives, right? The greatest good that God desires is for us to be most satisfied in Him. And so let me just, let's just take out the checklist Let's just throw it away, right? All right, for me, it was like brunette, blue-eyed, like good birth and hips. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, this is, <laughs> don't look at me like that, guys. Y'all know you were looking. Come on now. <laughs> Let's throw that away and recognize what our purpose is. Now, I would just say this kind of as we kind of wrap this whole thing up. The process of becoming more like Jesus is not easy. Sometimes it's, it's easy, right? Sometimes it's like, man, I feel like God's calling me to, you know, not eat chicken anymore. So I'm going to just eat a bunch of hamburgers now. Like, all right, well, that's fine, I guess. But what if it becomes something that you really love? Like, what is it in your life that was a good thing when it started, but now it's become kind of a, a God thing in your life that you have to Get rid of. My brother and I used to do this skit. It was uh, uh, one we ripped off from another, uh, another group. So we used to travel up and down the East Coast and do skits and, and improv comedy and things like that. And uh, in one of the skits that we did, was, it was called a, a chisel skit. The idea was that one of us would be a person and one of us would be God. And the idea is that God was kind of chiseling away things in your life that he needed to get rid of, things that would make you more, uh, things that made you less like him so that you could become more like him. And in that skit, it was intended to be funny at some level, like, ha ha, this is cute. But on the other side, it was intended to be really serious. 
But oftentimes it's really difficult for us to give up things in our lives that hold us back from becoming more like Jesus. And so what we see here is that God, God never promises to you and to me. He never promises that the difficult things in our lives will lead to good things. I can't stress this enough. It's, it's not a one for one. God never promises that the difficult things in our lives will lead to good things. That's not what he says here. At least not in this world. He promises even greater things than we could ever imagine in eternity. But if you go, man, I'm just having a string of bad luck, you might have a string of bad luck the rest of your life. If you lose your job, it doesn't mean that God's going to replace it with a bigger, better paying job. Right now, I could preach a real good message. If, y- if y'all wanted me to shift gears, let me, I- I'll tell you how, let me just show you how coffee cup Christianity works. All right, if I'm going to preach a good message, here's what it'd be. Now listen, y'all. If y'all just give me all your money, <laughs> give me, liquidate your assets, give me all your money, God will do good things in your life because God works together all good things for those who love him. And if you love him, you're going to give me all your money. Now let's take up that offering one more time. Bring down the... Now look, I could really manipulate and twist that text to make you think that if you just give, 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 or if you just, oh, the bad things are coming. Yeah, God's going to bring me something great. Shift your perspective to see that God is attempting to create in you himself a duplicate of him, a restoration of creation where Adam and Eve were able to walk beside him. So to kind of kind of bring it all to a hold, I would just say this, that we see in verse 18 that glory is coming. And we see in verse 29 and 30 that that glory comes through God making us just like him. You know, the only thing that got me through wrestling camp, right, this awful experience in my life was the people that were there and was the hope that eventually this thing is going to be over and I'm going to go home. And I would say for you and for me this morning that we have two things that we get to hold on to when it comes to hope. This morning, if you're like, man, I'm just in a tough place. I'm struggling. I can't seem to overcome this hurdle. I'm battling with myself. I'm battling with these demons in my life that I just can't shake. Take hope in two things. One, the Spirit is here. And He will be with you through it all. He will walk alongside of you through it all. And second of all, this world is not your home. And it may be terrible while you're here. I mean, I don't think Paul, at the end of his life, goes, boy, that was fun. I'd like to do that again. I really missed out on one more lashing, but ugh. We may not get to the end of our lives and go, boy, that, I'd like to do that one more time. But here's the beautiful thing. When we pass from this life into the next, we will have greater things than we could have ever imagined waiting for us on the other side. But here's the thing. If this morning your hope is in what good things you can get or in anything other than your faith in God, if it's not anchored and rooted in your faith in God, then when the bad things happen, you'll lose all hope. I can preach hope till I'm hoarse this morning. But if it's not rooted in Christ, then when the bad things come, hope will be lost. And this morning, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, if you don't even know what that looks like, if you're struggling, we are here for you. That is why this church exists. Because we are all broken people. We're all, we're all searching for God to come and restore the brokenness and waiting for God to come and restore the brokenness in this world. So if that's you this morning, yeah, come down front, grab one of our prayer team, come out to the green wall, grab Matt, Pastor Matt, or myself. Let us pray with you, let us talk with you, because there's great hope in Jesus and nothing else. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and to worship freely here. God, I pray for those in this room that 
that feel like they're hopeless, that feel like they're at the end of it. Maybe they're, they're struggling this morning with, with thoughts or decisions that they have to make. God, maybe they are in a very difficult time in their life right now, and they feel like all hope is lost. Jesus, I pray that they would anchor their hope in you and you alone, that you would give them freedom from those thoughts, that God, this morning, that they would, that they would run after you, that God, they would see that even in the midst of difficulties, that you are there, you are walking alongside of them. God, bring your spirit in a special way this morning in this place, and God, allow freedom to come. We love you, and in the name we pray, amen. Have a great week, church. Thank you.